Hi, I'm Guy Lawrence and you are listening to the Guy Lawrence podcast. If you're enjoying this content and you want to find out more and join me and come further down the rabbit hole, make sure you head back to guylawrence.com.au. Awesome guys, enjoy the show. Trev, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Thanks Guy, mate. It's um, awesome to be back with you, buddy, and I've been looking forward to this chat. I appreciate it, mate. I appreciate it. Now, Trev, I ask everyone on the show, uh, which I did on the 180 podcast, and I'll do it for today as well, just in case people are not familiar with you. But if you were, say, on an airplane mm -hmm. and a stranger sat next to you and they said, what do you do for a living? What would you say? <laughs> Uh, I've actually had that many, many times and I think I've answered it so many different ways. <laughs> um, what do I do? I help people um, shift their consciousness, help the people become more aware of who they are, what they're capable of, um, open up that little vault inside of them that holds, you know, holds their dreams in protection and, uh, and allow them to bring it out a little bit so they can actually potentially manifest the life that they truly want. So I've never answered it that way, but that's exactly how I'm answering it in this okay. moment. I was, um, was going to... Close, but, uh, but yeah, no, I help people basically believe in themselves and, uh, and in, the, in the result of that subsequently, I feel as though I'm contributing to making the world a little bit better. Beautiful. And with a response like that as well, do you find people are very open to it and are, and are hungry for this work? Because you've been doing this such a long time and yeah. empowering people's lives. Have you seen like a change over, over the time since you've been doing it? 100%. I think I got led into this work because I was an athlete. I was a professional athlete and I spoke to a lot of people at the end of races on the finish line and I had a lot of success. So people would want to, they would look to me and they would look to me like I had the answers and I didn't have the answers. I'd worked out how to win a race, you know, but they were kind of saying to you, but yeah, you're tapping into something. If you explore it a bit more, you might have the answer, you know, um, at least for yourself. And so I found that I went away from sport with a bit of despair around um, my deeper spirit, deeper purpose. I wanted to help people at a much greater level than sign an autograph and actually um, wish them well in the future and be a good, good bloke to them, you know? So I kind of tried to do my best in that way. But what I found was I didn't have the capacity to have the conversation go any further, um, even though they probably wanted to and probably didn't even know what they would want to talk about. But that was the incomplete part of that whole journey was, what about all those people that I spoke to afterwards? What would I say to them if I had five hours or if I had them captive, you know, as an audience and we could talk together and share something. And so I went about a journey for a long period of time of firstly discovering who I really am and what I'm really about and who I am spiritually. Like what, what do I love? What are my deeper traits that have been hidden in my back aspects of my personality? You know, um, what am I right? What, who am I as a soul, you know? And, when I first discovered that, I then proceeded to probably shit myself or crap myself for about <laughs> five to 10 years because I was like, what, how am I gonna bring that out into the world? Because there's huge vulnerability about saying, I love people and I believe the whole world can change and I believe all of our answers, we've already got them on our own inside, you know? And if we connect and collaborate, they can come together. So over the same period of time that I've been finding the courage to speak more about it more openly, um, and not shy away from it, what's happened is I've also noticed that people are more ready to speak about it and more willing and able. So perhaps I'm on a bit of a timeline with the evolution of consciousness like we all are, that as I'm getting more ready, I'm noticing more people are ready. And I remember Eckhart Tolle was asked the question, um, you know, how many people, you know, what percentage of the, of the world population do you believe are awakening, you know? how many people are awake or awakening? And he said, as near as I can tell everybody, but that's because everybody who's awakening comes to me, you know? Um, so what I'm finding more and more is that law of attraction or that serendipity or synchronicity is that I literally sit next to somebody on the plane and happens all the time. And I go, Oh, I don't really feel like talking today, but I can feel this conversation's meant to go. <laughs> and I turn it reluctantly turn to my side and they go, hello, how are you? And they go, hello. And they go, oh, I'm so and so. And I go, I'm so and so. And they go, what do you do? You know, and I, they're literally right we just started. And I go, oh, I do this. Oh my God, I need that. You know, and then I, I really barely 
come ever, ever come across a person these days um, via that law of attraction that isn't saying, please, could you talk to me a little bit more about what you're saying? Because yeah. I think our heart's yearning, um, our soul, our spirit, our being, whatever you want to call it, is yearning for some truth. And truth is is not a concept. Truth is an idea that there's much more to us than meets the eye. Amazing. Amazing. And the thought that dropped in then is that you have been in a unique situation because it's like you, as an athlete, you'd found your purpose. Mm. So, or maybe so you thought, I'm not sure. Or maybe a sub-purpose, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, that becomes your identity, your life, and, and everything that you do and live by and breathe by. And then, like, underneath, there's almost a greater purpose. Yes. Com- coming out of the back of that that you probably weren't aware of. And, and, I, and I see that in myself and so many people to this day, and we almost fear that change. You said you were scared shitless. Yes. yes. <laughs> for, for, so, for so long, and I, I so relate to, to yes. this conversation. And I guess what, Dread what, and panic and fear. <laughs> yeah, and, and the question I'm guessing is, is there's so many questions coming from that, but how, how, um, how do you, should we be scared of that change? There's a question right there. Okay. First thing I'd say, from uh, everything's from my own perspective. So I'm just sharing freely from my own perspective, and hope it relates to other people, you know, as we do. But I, um, mate, I, I found one of my secondary purposes. So athlete, being as an athlete and racing, and even becoming, what a stupid word, weird word, but famous or celebrity or whatever. It's such a lot of crap, you know. But um, Becoming known or visible, what, what would we really call it? Visible or prominent or standing out or being seen or like being exposed, you know, um, to the world by doing something that somehow shines and people go, oh, my God, I'd like to be more like that. Or, oh, my God, that was amazing. How did you get over that wave or around this or through that situation? And So that element of shining, racing was like a secondary purpose that actually allowed me, at the time it felt like my purpose, but it was more closely aligned to an ambition, maybe a secondary purpose. But what it did was it was ultimately, it was a vehicle to find my greater purpose. And my greater purpose, and I love once again referring to Eckhart Tolle, is that I love when he says our primary purpose is to know ourselves as source. You know, our secondary purpose is to do something with that. So I believe that any aspects of my career, whether it was winning races, whether it was doing TV interviews, whether it was doing coaching clinics, whether it was being on the back of cereal boxes, whether it was going, you know, I went on Baywatch and met Michael Jackson, hung out with Madonna and all those sort of things. And now I know they're all vehicles. They're all um, part of my journey to expose me to more people, expose me to more experiences, to open me up to who I really am to show me who I wasn't, you know, who I'm not, to have me even feel for a while, that's who I am. No, that's not who I am. Um, And to also know that all those people that I got, um, I went down those paths with all that distorted, that's my purpose, that's who I am, or even the fame thing, that we all share a similar purpose as well and that they're not that either and that there's a lot of those people I've since connected with and, and then help them awaken a little bit to who they really are. So I'm like, oh, my goodness, there's all these layers and nuances and subtleties of, of why that all happened to me. So if I relate to coming largely out the other side of that journey and healing a lot of – I just turned 50 a um, couple of – two days ago, Guy. Oh, wow, congrats. Thanks, mate. And I, I, I went up and I actually um, – Went to the centre of Australia. We walked the Lara Pinta trek with with Life Changer, a youth foundation that I'm a founding partner of. And we took 21 people on a trek. And afterwards, my son and my wife and I went to Uluru and to the region and walked around. And there's two amazing schools of thought out there. One is that you're not allowed to climb on that rock. You know, it's sacred, it's sacrilege and you should, you to, to climb on it. Um, another school of thought out there is... Uh, This is the most incredibly spiritual place that will awaken you, whatever you do, you know, Um, which is a similar school. But but I got out there and I I climbed that rock twice as a kid, you know, as a four-year-old and I think an eight- or nine-year-old. And I had this this deep, intuitive, spiritual desire to go and climb the rock again. And I walked there and I stood at the base and and I found out from the elders that the main reason they don't want people to climb is that, when we're on their land, they feel responsible for us. So if something happens to us, it creates them huge despair. And, you know, 35 people have died climbing on Ayers Rock, you know, or Uluru. Mm-hmm. 
And so they say, no, it's not sacrilege for you to climb on the rock. It is a sacred path for our Mala men on their journey. But, but the biggest thing is that they have huge fear around the safety and what it causes them spiritually to know that these people are just running all over the rock like Europeans trying to claim that they've climbed the rock and everything else. And it occurred to me that that's not why I wanted to be there at all, that, I, that this is my country too and I wanted to connect with it and I have a very deep Indigenous connection and, and a lot of elders that I've worked with and everything. And I went, I'm meant to climb it now as an adult and almost do my own rites of passage, you know. And I just so happened to have my 20-year-old son with me and uh, we hopped on the rock and it was the most incredible gentleness that came out of it. And as I climbed up that whole thing and looked out, there was actually water all over it because it had rained the day before. So I literally stripped off and had a swim in one of the pools on top of Uluru, which I'm sure not many people have done. <laughs> if any, I don't know. But um, it, was like a, it was like a christening. It was like a, you know, a baptism of some type spiritually. And I, all I can say is I felt t- thoroughly looked after by the universe up there. So, and I was looking after it and it was looking after me and I was very respectfully doing so, you know. So we came back down and I drove through the countryside the next day and I had this amazing experience that there's stuff out there that's several hundred million years old, Katajuda and Uluru and the mountains and Kings Canyon and everything on the Larry Pinta Trail, the West McDonnell Ranges and everything. And it doesn't give a crap about what you think or what you do or anything else. That energy is just alive and raw and it's got a permanence to it and a, and a length of lifespan to it that makes our little buildings and the airport that I arrived back to, to on the Gold Coast and the cars that we drive, it makes them look like a blink and a flash. They'll be gone. They'll be in a hole. They'll be knocked back over again. And everything we're competing for and fighting over and everything is all so small and so minuscule. And we're in a almost a construct or a paradigm in the Western world that there's all these important things that we've got to get more of. Mm. And, I teach this as well, but it's amazing how many times you teach what you most need to learn. And I had a really, really profound still spiritual experience of realizing it's all a load of garbage. Our primary purpose is to know ourselves as the very energy that's in that rock, that's in those mountains, that's in those incredible that, that escarpments and that space that's in every single living thing, including each other. Our secondary purpose is to do something with it. Now, there's nothing wrong with actually trying to win Ironman races or trying to run a business or trying to earn money or try and pay off your mortgage and everything else. The only problem is when, you, when you're when under the illusion that it defines you because the moment you realise that it, we are far greater than that and who we really are, you begin to be able to explore all that and, and don't make that wrong. You begin to be able to explore the game of life, the journey of life and this paradigm that we're all kind of caught in you can explore it with fun and enthusiasm and interest rather than significance and expectation and attachment, you know, and limitation and everything else. You can begin to go, oh, if my journey, which I feel was so unconscious, led me to more consciousness, then everybody's journey, no matter how unconscious, is going to lead them over some period of time, not a matter of if, only a matter of when, towards more consciousness. So I just think, We've got to, it sounds so funny because I've just probably said something quite deep and profound, but my end thing is we've got to take it not so seriously, <laughs> which is hard to do because it's so you realise the great depth of all life is inside of you, but, but it's literally like, oh my goodness, we're in, human beings are incredible and there's a lot of love in us and there's a lot of compassion and depth and, and if all we do is just serve that and feed that. Even if we're in a job we don't like right now, just go with a, a slightly better attitude tomorrow and love the person we're working with and, or forgive them or let them off the hook or forgive yourself or let yourself off the hook. You cannot not succeed if you just do a bit of that each day. So, and it's, yeah. it's simple and profound that, you, that, that that nirvana that does actually exist, which is that knowing yourself as source and experiencing the oneness of life, um, is available to everybody when we can just let go of all these other things that we're grabbing onto. And I had, while I was away, I had some really profound spiritual experiences, but also some indigenous spiritual experiences and connections with people out there. And oh, it was beautiful, the reverence and the way they honour the dream time and their explanation of how everything came into existence. And I had a really profound awareness of, oh, 
um, that's going on moment by moment. It, and nothing really exists unless we make it true. You know, so what would you like to bring out of the realms of possibility and produce it into this world, even just via your own happiness and thought? And since that, every day I've woken up, which has been about five days since I really had that experience, going, wow, my number one priority today is really enjoy myself. I'm going to have a great life. I'm going to have a great day today. And I haven't had that for a while. I've been trying to solve things and work with people and get a group of people together and all these big, seemingly big picture things. But it's been exhausting and fatiguing because my highest priority wasn't just to enjoy the ride. Amazing. It, it is, isn't it? It's almost like we just need to slow down and take it day by day and, and actually enjoy the gift of the day that's been given to us. And enjoy each other, mate. And enjoy this conversation. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy what's hidden in the conversation that will reveal itself if we slow down. If, you know, the if guy I, in the milk bar will say some amazing things to you if you slow down and just, you know, I love in Avatar when they say, I see you, you know. Yeah. If we say, even without our words, if we just look at them and go, I see you, you know, or I'm going to, I don't see you, but I'll stop for long enough until maybe I can. That's a start because amazing stuff reveals itself. It's incredible. And, and that's what's been happening for me. I mean, why do you think we're always striving for something beyond our reach to then go, once I have that, I will then be complete and happy? Because t- to me, that almost is then subconsciously telling myself, well, I'm not complete now. That's right, yeah. And I have to get that to feel whole, which... Yeah. Well, I think, I, and I've worked a lot on this lately, is that everything exists for a purpose, even the dysfunctional things. So there is a double-edged sword in that. Absolutely, while we're doing it, we're cementing the idea that I mustn't be good enough because I need more to be better, you know. But what also happens, there's a baby in that bath water, and the baby is that something inside of us knows there is something better. So, you know, when we go, oh, I shouldn't be wishing and hoping and everything else, I should just be with what I've got, we're actually cutting off the idea that maybe there's actually more inside of me as well. So we're potentially looking in the wrong place because we're looking out there for it. But the idea of searching, I don't have a huge problem with as long as you're looking for it inside of yourself because that's ultimately where you're going to find it, you know. And then when you do find it inside of yourself, you'll notice it reflecting in other places. You'll see it reflecting in other people and other situations and opportunities open up to you. So then you go, is this all just our reflection? Are we in a, are we in a house of mirrors? You know, because possibilities that this, we can manifest anything in this life. Sounds so simple to say that depending on what you're aware of, but we can manifest anything in this life if we simply connect with it first, you know? And so I I like the idea of us thinking there's more and there could be more. It's just, it's been misdirected towards thinking I've got to accumulate more as opposed to more might be available to me if I allow that I already have it, you know, and that could come right back down to just saying, can I, and the simplest thing is, can I start with just being happy with who I am right now in this situation? In all of its shortcomings and all of its shortfalls, can I find the beauty and the appreciation, what you appreciate, appreciates? I love that saying. You know, in other words, it grows. What you focus on grows. And likewise, in the opposite, what you resist persists. So when we're trying to get more money or more time or more freedom, there's a good desire in that but we're usually doing it because we want to have less trouble and less hassle and less this and less that. We're still focused on what we don't want. So by resisting the illusion of what we don't have, it persists. So mm. we get a new job, we set new goals, we get new possibilities. At the end of the day, we do all our taxes and we end up with the same amount of money. You know, often people say, I earned 20 times more in the last two years than I earned 10 years before that, but I've ended up with the same amount of money in my account because the bills just got bigger because we haven't shifted our paradigm. And, and I, I love that. I think it's an Einstein, it's paraphrasing, I think it's an Einstein quote, um, you cannot solve a problem on the same level of mind that it was created. created. And what ultimately that means is that, oh goodness, unless we change our paradigm, unless we shift our consciousness, we can only get the same. And same level of mind, what happens if we created something on no level of mind at all? That'd be pretty cool. (laughs) Because then, you know, you could have it. Well, why do you think, there's so many questions you're triggering off here. Um, Why do you think we're generally frightened to look within? You know, we dismiss it at first. We go, you know, we can even go, that's woo-woo. You know, and then we're fixated. But 
there's definitely a current yeah. needed. I can speak personally and say how it relates to me is that mm. I think um, through so much of my life, at the point in time which I was a young kid and I was freely showing my um, quirkiness and my uniqueness and my love and kissing my dad on the lips and, you know, being a boy and being, you know, half female, half male, or half yin, half yang in the sense of loving and caring and soft and fluffy but determined and all those sort of things. And you show that into the world, you know, and what happens is this world says no. No, you choose one or the other. You'd be male or female. You'd be a girl or a boy, you know, and don't show all of you. You're not allowed to. Um, that quirkiness is ridiculous. You look like a fool. You're a bloody idiot. You know, you're ugly. You're whatever you are. You're stupid. You're dumb. You're skinny. You're fat. You're, you know, whatever it might be. You're slow. Um, and so I think we actually, we hide that quirkiness, which also holds our uniqueness and holds our spirit in our heart. And then we hide it, but there's a little subtle defense system that goes out from then on. It's like a little thing that's always on the lookout for another attack. So now what do I have to be to not be attacked? Well, I have to be cool. I have to be popular. I have to be smart. I have to be sexy. I have to be, you know, the fastest. I have to be the strongest. I have to be, you know, whatever it is. You know, I have to lay low, I have to hide, I have to... So we don't want to be attacked anywhere. We don't want to be, it goes right back into our DNA of being outcast from the tribe. You know, we don't want to be isolated, um, publicly assassinated or accused or bullied or, or pointed at or, or whatever it may be. So at these subtle unconscious levels, we're hiding our beautiful part of ourselves for fear of it being judged. So all of a sudden, someone says to us, hey, there's way more to you and life's amazing and you can explore these incredible possibilities and you're a creator and a manifester and, wow, do the work and you can discover who you really are and, you know, but think positive and law of attraction, all this sort of stuff. And then you go, you're kind of going, yeah, 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 I want to view that. But this other energy's going, but who's going to protect me? Well, who, well I drop my guard because to view the very thing I'm protecting, I have to let go of the thing that's protecting it, you know, so... I think one of the subtle reasons why we so scared to look inside is because when we have in the past, we've been hammered or punished or isolated or judged or criticized or laughed at or made the mock of someone's jokes or whatever it may be. And that seems to be a planetary construct. I don't have met many people that haven't been belittled at some stage or yeah. felt, you know, isolated even by their own mum, dad, uncles, aunties, brothers, sisters, but then school and that, year or two older in school or people on the bus or, you know, whatever it may be. So there's this, this tender, gentle, vulnerable place in that holds all of our power. But when we go to go towards it, I think it's really important to have a few people or at least one, but maybe a few or a quiet space around you that you feel that it's safe to drop your guard while you explore it. Ultimately, when you do drop your guard, you get down in there and you go through the victim state and through the hurt state and through this, the, the vulnerable, susceptible little being state and you find your resistance and you find your own inner mongrel and your own inner fight and the own, your own version of the same asshole that's making it unsafe for you. You find that inside of yourself. You free yourself of that energy and then you have your sensitivity, your vulnerability, but you also have your strength and you can't really be taken out. Yeah. You know? But to go through that journey... There, there, I believe that we need to have an element of safety around us. So I could answer that question 10 different ways, but that's the way that popped up for the moment is I think for most of us, we don't feel safe to explore inside. When we do, it creates more problems than we had before. And in our mind, we go, oh, it's just too hard. Bugger it, I'm better off. Just You can't beat them, join them. Just go back to the nine to five or, you know, break a few rules, screw a few people over, I'll just get a good mortgage, you know, pay off my mortgage and get an investment property and then I'll be happy then. But we, we, we're trading off who we really are for the promise that if I can just um, secure my financial or physical status, that'll be enough. But there's this incredible despair and horrible spiritual death sitting inside of us going, no, it's not enough unless you find out who you really are and get comfortable with that. And then you can have or not have the money and you feel powerful and by the way then you can have the money and the possessions and everything else because 
they're just available to you. You can create them if you want. It's up to you. Yeah, so well, so well articulated. It, um, <clears throat> it's interesting since I've sort of stepped on my new, on my path, which I feel like more on purpose. I actually tell myself daily, I have all the time in the world. I mm. I'm just going to go at this. Yeah that needs to be because i find like there's this this pressure and you get caught up in it and i think like you say it's almost like you take the suit off to yep. bear yourself and yeah. and you're like what are people thinking what, are, what, <laughs> what, are they, what uh, am i going mad is this normal is this okay yeah. uh, how, how do, why do i suddenly feel so good is this real what's happening exactly and then you <laughs> it, it sounds so cliche but you see the um I don't know. You see that the, the happiness and joy in in, in your day, like because you you kind of out of that flight or fight response, that stress response, where you're just continually fixated on the things that are driving the wheels. And the moment you break free, it's like I don't know. It's like a backpack's off your back, twenty kilos lighter, and yeah, um, it's amazing. I think um, I think in my own journey has been another thing that Eckhart Tolle says is that you know, take every moment to deconstruct your ego whenever you see your ego arise. And as he says, ego just simply equals unconscious. So ego is just the unconscious aspects of ourself. A lot of people think ego equals arrogance. Now, arrogance is a form of ego. Arrogance is just, arrogance simply means that we don't really believe in ourselves and we're trying to project that we're great, you know? Um, so ego is anything unconscious, including I'm not good. I'm no good. I can't do this. It's any unconscious splintered aspect of ourself. You could call it your shadow self. He calls it the little me as well. You know, okay. but I know for myself is that there's this incredible, beautiful peace that's available and is present right here and now as I'm present, as I'm not trying to prove anything or be anything or be anybody. I'm living in peace. I'm living in beauty. I'm living in love. It's a, it's a, an experience. It's, it's real. It's right here, right now. Um, and that sounds like cliche, -ish, but it literally is the absence of ego, the absence of um, desire or pushing or striving or all these sort of things that believe we're going to get it some other way. And what I've realized for myself is that ego is like a construct. It's like literally another version of myself, but it's had so much gravity and attached to it. And it's in, it's inside of me like a, like a, a shadow version of myself. And basically everything it does is the opposite of who I really am. You know, um, <laughs> it, it, I'm trying to prove myself, you know, yeah. through that. And yet when I'm really myself, I've got no desire to prove myself whatsoever you know, or I'm trying to win and coming from a place of needing to win. And when I actually really just myself, I like, I already feel like I've, I've won and I've succeeded and there is nothing to win, you know? So it's almost the antithesis of who we are, which is hence why we call it the shadow or the mirror or the reflection, because it's literally that darker thing. But I don't buy the concept that it's there permanently. What I believe is it's there, but as you come to terms with it and you um, love it and you you break down and you, um, what's the word I'm looking for? By understanding it, by seeing it, by loving it, by being with it, by yes. trusting that it's there for a purpose, you almost transmute the energy and it restores back to your beingness. So your ability to hold that space of being in the, in the here and now grows out like a, a marshmallow puffing out even further, you know, and this shadow darky sort of splintery self that hangs around you diminishes back in and gets closer into the center of your spine and might even go through some absolute death knells before it dies, you know, and more fear and more things. But that's what Eckhart's referring to. when he says, take every opportunity to deconstruct your ego. Um, because I haven't done it myself, you know, I can, I, it's diminished. I feel greater amounts of to get back to there and I probably demonstrate more love and everything else. It's, there's definitely been a journey there, but my goodness, the right person says the right thing at the right time. And I'm like, you know, it like, it hits me and I'm like, well, but now I, I know straight away. Wow. I've gone past the point where I think that's real. What just happened? And I know, wow, I've still got some of that inside of me because I want to beat them up or prove, you know, the old Iron Man competitive win at all cost self. I go, I thought I'd finish with that. And it's just sitting there inside of me, brewing, wanting to have the last say, you know. And 
So I, I know for myself, I'm still on that journey. And, but I know that, you know, on your shirt, it says, relax, nothing is under control. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's the funny thing is when you let go of control and you allow things to be, um, you, the bit that you're letting go in the allowing is you're no longer fueling it and you're no longer operating under the idea that if I can control this, it'll be better. And you're letting go of the idea that you're separate from source and that you, you know, your own, that you're not divine. You know, it's, it sounds so funny because I live a very normal, simple life and, you know, in some ways, but I travel the world, work with some amazing people and healing and everything else. But I just love being with my kids and my family and going on the beach and, and I love trying to help and challenge different things and people plug me in and I'm like, Oh, you know, but it's a journey. We've got to face these things and confront them and ultimately come out the other side and learn from them. The yeah, side. totally. And, yeah. and love the people. There's those particular people that just managed to push your buttons in exactly the right way. And usually when you, they're gold, you know, one of my great mates and spiritual teachers, he says to me, Trevor, it takes a, a lot these days to plug you in. So the fact that you got plugged in, there must be gold in that. You know, you should embrace it. Gold, I've spent a long time trying to get my sanity and now like, this guy's disrupting me. He's like, yeah, can you hear yourself? I'm like, whoa, hang on, you're right. It takes a lot to plug me in. So whatever he's teaching me, I must really, really need it because, um, goodness, G, G did it plug me in. And then you, you, you learn to love those people and thank them for bringing that to you because otherwise I would have been operating under the illusion that I already made it and I clearly yeah. hadn't. You know, I still had an arsehole inside of me. So. Uh, it, it's so true. I think one of the things that stands out for me over the years as I've been looking at this work more is, is being able to just and become the observer of your yeah. thoughts, feelings and actions through your day. And like you say, when that ego arises, when you have that, those trained response that we've done our entire life kick in, yeah. And the moment you can catch yourself and actually see yourself almost like a third person going, oh, there's those feelings, there's those emotions, that's what we're behaving and being able to intervene. Yeah. It can be a game changer because then it doesn't piss us off for the next four days because it's happened and we carry it and brew with it and, and keep living that way. Oh, mate, there's three simple levels that come to mind. And number one is when we don't react the same way we always do, we free out because we've not actually fed that little black wolf inside. You know, the act of observing is probably the second level by being the observer, you create space between yourself and the situation and in the space is the answer. So that's, that's number two. Number three is, and there's, there's probably a fourth one comes up, but number three is that actually occasionally you can see the whole pattern. So you go, hang on, this type of person has made me react this many times before, right back to this situation. And hang on a second, I'm probably the type of person that makes that person react. Da, 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 da. So you can see the patterned response. And as soon as you start freeing out of patterns, you're now moving really, really fast because you're not moving one situation at a time. You're moving yeah. hundreds of situations, possibly thousands, and possibly all the people it relates to, you're unhooking from all the drama and everything that relates to that pattern. So I often say to myself, I go, oh, I'm free to that, I'm not responded. Do I feel fully free? And I go, no, there must be a pattern here. So when I see the pattern, I free myself out even further and then go, wow. And then sometimes I then feel free. Or then I go, now do I feel free? And if it's no, I go to that fourth level and which is why was I meant to see this? Was it not just for me? Who else am I meant to see it for? And then all of a sudden I might see the US political race between left and right or I might see the war between this country and that country or I might see something going on in our own country or in my own, an organisation that I'm working with or another family down the road. And I begin to realise the purpose of why... I was meant to see this at this time. So not only free myself out from reacting, not only be the observer and create some space between it, not only see the pattern of the whole thing and plays the way it plays out, but see the bigger purpose of why that, how that pattern plays out on the whole world and perhaps on the whole planet and how I might be able to actually help shift that or come outside of it. So all of a sudden you've gone from being at the bottom of the barrel angry and upset and through those four levels you can almost be off planet. You know, it sounds bizarre, but you can be off the construct of the planet going, oh, I can see how this happens. 
and you lose your judgment on the rest of the world. You lose your, why don't you come right outside the whole construct and the resistance of being alive on this planet and you begin to realize I'm just one other person that can make a difference if I free myself out, you know, yeah. and that yeah. returns all the way back around to now being able to say something to that person or not saying anything at all, but be free, you know, observe that US political race or you observe this or that and know that there's nothing happening that's outside of yourself anyway. It's all the same stuff. It's just on what level, you know, yeah. and then we don't get involved in all these fights and these arguments and you don't get involved in the left versus the right and the right versus the wrong and the black versus the white and the male versus the female and the, you know, the poor versus the rich and, you know, all this sort of stuff because it's all a construct and it's all designed to keep us going over and over the same stuff and actually not, reach each other and not have the power of actually actually making a difference in this moment and it's massive it's massive to close to close that loop for the listeners before we change gears trev a thought that occurred in there for anyone listening to this right now that is hearing that and they go oh that makes sense like but i you know 95 percent of the day i think bruce lipton said it we run from the subconscious we're just constantly yeah. trying these patterns right yeah. And what one tool or tip or something have you found really useful over the years to give us a nugget so people listening to this go, oh, okay, I can go and try that or start with that? I'll give you two. I don't know what the second one is, but I know it's there. It'll come in a minute. But the first one is, <laughs> um, the first one is that comes to mind. It's a bit of a different way of answering it. The first thing is that I recognised at 30 years of age um, I'm 50, as I said, just turned 50. I recognise at 30 how it was a blink of an eye since my 21st because I had a 30th birthday party with a few friends. And it gave me a little bit of um, reverence for how things are just going to happen anyway. You know, so there's a lot of stuff's going to happen before your next major milestone in your life. So now I've just turned 50 and I specifically remember that 30th and that 20 years has gone by so fast and I know the next 20 years is going to go by so fast. So at 70 years of age, what impact would I have liked to have had? Rather than what do I want to do now, da, 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 what's possible to make a difference with now, is what seems impossible now, but I'd love to have made a dint at by the time I'm 70 because I know I'm going to get there and I know when I get there, I'm going to go, how quick did that go? So if I spend a quarter of a percent of a day of my day or 1% or 2% or whatever working on something that's a non-negotiable for me to come about in 20 years time. I'm going to feel a lot better in 20 years time to know that I, it sounds funny after all the be in the moment things that I'm saying, but in the construct of time and space, how can I be proud of maybe how far I've evolved or the impact I've had? So I, I think what's the little 1% time. So when I hear the Bruce Lipton 95% thing, I go, yeah, but imagine if next year it could be 94% of your day. You know, imagine if next year, the year after it could be 92%. Imagine next year, the year after it could be 88% because it, you incrementally increase your power to be in the moment and not coming from the subconscious. So when I find something scare me away, like the idea that that will take forever or 95% of the day, I go, hmm, I better not spend all my day thinking about that because you know, it's going to really tangle me because it's a bigger one. It's one of the biggies. But what I can do is make damn well sure that I chip away at that one because I know in 20 years' time I'm going to be in a different place and if I chip away at it now, I can make a difference at it. So that's the first thing that I do is I, I put things into timelines in a sense, short-term, medium-term, long-term. I would really love to make a major difference to the consciousness of this planet, you know, Am I going to help be able to do that today? Well, I now know I can by being there for one other person moment by moment. But when I didn't understand the impact of that, uh, well, I know over a long period of time I can, so I'll just do a little bit towards that every single day. So at least I might build up ahead of steam and some, some momentum to feel as though I'm making a difference. You know, and ultimately what's happened, I've become more self-aware. I've said more things that have helped more people. I've worked with more people. My circle of influence has expanded. I've been on more podcasts and more shows and I've spoke more truth and I speak more about life and consciousness now than, than I do about Ironman racing and all the other stuff that used to be so important to talk about, you know. So, wow, I've progressively travelled this path by just trusting in what can I do today. Yeah. That probably leads me to the second thing is my great spiritual teacher once said, um, and there's two things that I want to say in this is, <clears throat> um, he once said, all 
just leave every situation. If all you did was leave every situation at least a little better than you found it, you'll live a truly remarkable life. And so, oh, instead of focusing on how can I make this situation better for me, I focus on how can I leave this situation a little bit better for everybody involved in it. Huh. And sometimes it actually, I've noticed, has to get worse before it gets better. But I've had to trust that that's part of the process, that people are going to get upset with the change that I'm trying to make or whatever. But just make it a little bit better the next day, a little bit better the next day, a little bit better until ultimately it, it comes through. But I've lived by that for a long time. And between that, following my own intuition, which, uh, you know, I do more progressively all the time, and I know you do, Guy, a lot, um, is that I just, if something inside of me says to do it, even if I think, I don't do that anymore, or what, I don't, if my mind resists it, and my intuition says do it, I 100% do it mm -hmm. against the resistance of it. Um, and then finally, just the idea that we're in a house of mirrors. You know, that um, when you walk into a house of mirrors, that one mirror is going to be facing towards you and your reflection is going to be really obvious that it's your reflection. Another mirror is facing on a slight angle, which actually faces another one on a slight angle, slight, a slight angle, slight angle all the way around. And you can still see yourself, but you see yourself from a slightly different angle, you know, and you get a different perspective on you, how you even look to yourself. And then you look left and there you are facing yourself again, but then just slide to the right, there's the back of you, you know, and there's all these different angles in a house of mirrors. And you're trying to find your way through that house of mirrors, but everything is reflecting one degree of difference of who you are. And I walked through a shopping center one day and I realized that that's what life is, is that every person, some of them are facing you straight on and your reflection's really easy to see. Some of you are reflected, refracted through, some of them are refracted through many other versions and all you can see is a slight angle of the back of yourself, but it's still you you're looking at, Yeah, <laughs> you know? And when you realize that, you realize that, well, I don't have to face everyone face on, you certainly have to face those. Still, everything is reflecting us in some way, shape or form to a greater or lesser degree. And when you realize that, it's much easier to find your way through that house of mirrors lovingly and thankfully for everybody who's in it because by giving them, by then giving you the reflection, you know you only have to face the one that's straight on and that's the way to go. And you go towards that. When you get there, you can find another way through. Um, so that's been really, really helpful for me because, uh, you know, final thing I'd say is that there's a third, fourth and fifth dimension in the way I relate to it. Third dimension is this physicality of this world. Fourth dimension is our mind and our ability to control energy and our ability to consciously co-create at high levels of the fourth dimension, our experience. And fifth dimension is where we tap into our pure beingness and beyond. It goes beyond that. And there's a lot of stuff going on between that third and fifth that I believe the planet is waking up to right now. People are beginning to ask simple questions like, why do I react that way? Or why did that happen? Or I'm sick of doing the same thing over and over again. That is us challenging the fourth dimension. We're challenging the patterns. We're beginning to get restless and unconscious, uh, sort of conscious to it and wake up to it. And even if somebody outside, if it rattles us outside, clear it inside of yourself and keep going because we're all going through a kind of painful waking up process. But if we just leave every situation a little bit better than we found it, you'll find that everybody you need, right when you need a helping hand or you need someone to say it's okay and give you a big hug and let you know that you're loved, they'll be there. And right when you need to toughen up and man up and be or woman up and be the person that's actually, you know, the one holding the being the adult for the day, you'll do that as well. But what you, whatever you, what you need is there, you know? Yeah, yeah. love it. Love it, Trev. Mate, I'm conscious of the time. I'm yep. going to change gears. Yep. And I have some questions that I ask everyone on the show. Yep. And the first one is, what's been a low point in your life that you've had, but later in life turned out to be a blessing? Oh, there's been, there's been so many, you know, so many points that I've felt like the bottom of the barrel, you know, from sickness of having pretty hectic glandular fever, which I managed to free out of by finding the emotional issue behind it. And now if I get a blood test, I have no glandular fever in my system. So that's medically impossible, but it's actually medically possible. So that was pretty amazing experience. Wow. Um, I had broken relationship that would never ever heal. And I healed it by healing myself and actually by recognizing that, that my ex partner was trying to tell me something 
you know, when I heard what I was being told, I've got the love for her back and I could see her for who she really was. And that gave me more love for my part, my current partner and everybody else. So she was the, the thorn in my side was actually the greatest blessing as well, you know, so, um, and taught me unconditional love and, and so many things and taught me it's not about anyone else, it's about yourself, you know. That was really, really profound, which then led me to um, walking a journey with my wife who we've walked a journey to learn how to be in relationship from a place of freedom, from a place of letting ourselves be no expectation on each other and fully supporting each other. I think it's Gary Zukav that said um, that a, a spiritual partnership is a partnership that exists between two equals that is authentic partnership is a partnership that exists between two equals that exists to support each other's spiritual growth. It's something along those lines. And I just have the most profound love and connection for my wife and my kids and my kids are growing up incredibly because of that and my connection with my ex-wife and that, and the love that's there is unbounding because it's not to do with anyone else. It's to do with me, you know, and it's for them, it's to do with them, you know, and we're all on that journey. So that's been the most profound thing. More recently, I've tried to make organisational change at a couple of different majorly impactful organisations and I've ended up having to get in really close and as I've got in really close, I've gotten fingers burnt and I've got burnt and I've got upset and despairs come back again and, and I've experienced being attacked and being, you know, um, people covertly taking me out from the background and playing games and all sorts of different stuff but, but little old me, he's got a good intention, you know, and then... What that did is brought out anywhere where I hadn't resolved any of my inner mongrel or the part of me that would get revenge or would prove them wrong once and for all. So they gave me a huge opportunity to heal. Um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of talk around um, psychopathic and sociopathic and narcissistic behaviour, which is just really deep, deeply embedded unconscious and unconscious negative energy fields that live inside of people. And they they live to to draw, support themselves to keep going, not the person, but the energy just runs that person, you know. Yeah. Very disconnected, very unaware of people around them, everything else. And I've bumped into more of those lately, and I had to face that energy. And when I think back, that was the energy that I ran away from when I was a kid, and I turned myself into the Iron Man to cope with it. And I thought, if I win wow. everything, I'll be able to change the rules of the game. And it didn't change the rules of the game. All I did was became the same person. <laughs> I, I became the same narcissist, you know. <laughs> um, by trying to beat it, I became it. By resisting it, it persisted, you know. By judging it, I became it, you know. So more recently, I've been taught more unconditional love and it's become a blessing. But it's been really, really challenging the last couple of years. But, um, wow, it's been opening me back up to who we really are and how a lot of compassion for people and realising you cannot know a man until you've walked a mile in their moccasins because we're all fighting major battles and it's incumbent on me to actually clear out my own bullshit and be able to provide a space because that's what I like to do. So stop whinging about it and get on with it. <laughs> Thanks for sharing those, Trev. Now, well, um, what does your morning routine look like? Um, I do a lot of traveling. So um, it, it various different things. But if I'm around and various parts of when I'm traveling, I will get up with either my wife or a close friend, a um, couple of a few different people, quite often my wife, and we'll go for a walk on the beach with the dog relatively early. If, I'm, if I've been on a big thing, I might sleep in a bit, but relatively early. We'll walk and we'll sit down together and we'll talk. If there's any tension between us, it gets resolved on the walk because it just boils up to the surface. And we always laugh about if something's built up over a period of time, It'll be a blow up before the halfway point. And just after the halfway point, we start to recover and then we both heal and forgive each other and go, oh, sorry, I was being an idiot. Um, but we always come back and then we sit, we do a bit of qigong together, we meditate, you know, really gently or simply or very naturally. Um, might do a little bit of yoga on the beach. Joe might be down there 15 minutes with me. I might stay down for another 45 minutes or an hour because I do work with a lot of people. So I do try and cleanse my energy a lot. And then I'll have a swim in the ocean. I'm right. I can see the beach from where I'm sitting. It's just there. Um, I have a swim in the ocean and I have my spiritual bath and I go under the water and listen to the whales or the dolphins or, you know, and I just reconnect basically until I come back to that place where everything's okay and I don't have to do anything. 
And if I can come from that, then it's a pretty, it's usually a pretty amazing week, not just an amazing day. If I can get back to that space in the morning, I get a week's worth of good, good creation out of that. But uh, I try and do that as often as possible. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, last question. Uh, and this relates to outside of your family. If you could have dinner with anyone tonight from any time frame, who would it be and why? One person? One or one, two, three, a banquet? Three. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've I've um I've thought about that a few times. I, Eckhart Tolle, I'd love to sit and have dinner with him. Um, I'd love to have dinner with Jesus Christ. Yeah, you know, and uh, I'm not religious, and and a lot of Christians go, "Oh, you're Christian," because I, you know, those are the natural traits to all of us when we're more free. Uh, but no, I'm not. Um, I'd love to have JC Eckhart, and probably maybe Buddha would be a good one um, to, to sit with and have dinner. Um, but more recently, there's some really profound people. Nassim Haramine, um, a quantum physicist who would just be remarkable and it actually is a friend of a friend's. Um, so I'll probably have that dinner at one stage, but um, would be really cool to have there. And then I have some really cool friends that around the planet that are quite interesting. Probably Kelly Slater comes to mind, who is a big picture person. And it'd be nice to share the conversation with him and then finally my wife and kids. Yeah, beautiful. beautiful. Bit of a banquet. Yeah, that would be, be an amazing banquet, mate. Um, just to wrap it up, is there anything you would like to leave for our listeners to ponder on from everything we've covered today? Um, yeah, I just, I think probably, you know, that we have all the beauty and the love inside of us that we need. You know, everything we're looking for is already inside of us. So as best you can, notice if you find yourself looking somewhere else for it because you're looking in the wrong place if you're looking elsewhere you might notice it elsewhere but whatever you're noticing elsewhere is still a reflection of what's inside of you if you can find it inside of yourself you can share it with anybody and uh and you can come from a place of stillness and profoundness and um less judgment than everything else and i think there's so many politically motivated um, mindsets that are passing themselves off as humane at the moment even, you know, one world ideas of government, all that sort of stuff is just ridiculous because people have the power inside of them. We don't need to hand our, our sovereignty over to somebody else. So I think even a lot of, a lot of judgment going on. I mentioned the US political race a couple of times, but I watched the, the Clinton-Trump thing and I heard things like he's this and she's that and they're both this. And I would say if you're in any judgment at all, you're missing the point is because something quite profound is happening and it's hidden in the details and uh, there's something going on with him. He's part of quite a quantum shift. Um, but our mainstream media is not actually reporting what's really going on. They're reporting the bits that they want to tell yeah. the story about it. And I just use as an example because it's such a highly profile, high profile example. Don't believe what you're reading and seeing and everything and don't believe even what you're feeling if it's coming from a reaction. If it's coming from reaction, it's your own wound trying to come to the surface. Let it come to the surface. Heal it. Don't make it about anybody else. Clear it in yourself. See it, in every, see it everywhere, but clear it in yourself. And then as soon as you're still, then look at the situation again and you'll realise that most of the time we're being hoodwinked by people that are making a lot of money out of our unconsciousness. So power is in us, mate. I, just, I believe in people and, and I just, it blows me away. I'm so humbled by people you know, and love and life and even us sharing our second podcast together. And I just feel so thankful for it. And I just feel thankful to have a opportunity to even speak freely, right or wrong or whatever. And my viewpoints are crazy or whatever, just to be able to freely speak. And, and that's why, you know, probably the last thing I'd say is I noticed, um, I think it's Alex Jones, Infowars was banned off of YouTube, Facebook, Spotify, everything, podcasts and everything. 48 hours ago and wow. some say he's a crazy man some say he's a conspiracy theorist he's, he's american everything everyone in america knows about him now because he's in the mainstream media and everything else and uh and i say that there's a there's a bad hand at play that's trying to stop him from speak speaking even though some of it's garbage it's up to us to discern it's not up to somebody else to control what we're listening to and their, their freedom of speech ideal that they started with they need to be protecting it, you know. I think we're a little bit better with it here, but uh, I certainly wouldn't be having victories over hearing anyone's speech being, um, 
you know, nullified because we don't like it. We don't like to hear it because hidden in that stuff is also some great truth. So it's just an example. It's not a, not a thing that I'm like a spokesperson for, but I just an example of don't believe what you're hearing, you know, trust, trust yourself because collectively we'll change this world. Yeah, totally. Trev, thank you so much. Uh, where can I send everyone that if listens oh, to this, they want to check out your work, mate? Where- yeah, thanks, Guy. Um, well, you know, as you know, I wrote the boot camp for the soul, which mm-hmm. is um, it's a 12-week online course. It's an unfolding works in the principle that everyone has their own answers so that they do it in their own home and workplace. It's two emails a day, six days a week, Sunday off for 12 weeks through 12 different stages of awareness and they can stop and start at any time they want. It just collects in their thing. They get their own page to go on to. They can go on to soulbootcamp.trevorhendy.com and I've had people go up to week three and then 12 months later say, I haven't got past week three, but it's already changed my life. I'll get back to it eventually. <laughs> um, do it at your own pace, just like that book that you, you pick up when you want to pick it up. But um, it really helps me when people go and do that, that course for me because it allows me to get out and do what I really love to do. And, and uh, it's, it's like $149 plus GST for a 12-week course, 156 emails or something. It's full of wisdom that I've learned from all sorts of different places. But it's not about what I'm saying and it's about what you realize in yourself and it's yeah. your own journey. So definitely, yeah, soulbootcamp.trevorhendy.com. Have a bit of fun with that. But, um, yeah, Top. thanks, mate. Love being with you. Thank you so much for coming on today. That was absolutely brilliant. And I have no doubt everyone listening will uh, will definitely have a lot to ponder on over the next few days for sure. Thank you so much, Trev. Thanks, mate. Cheers.